Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. And I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood Podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on YouTube. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Tango Shalom is now available on, on all, all VOD, VOD major platforms. platforms. <laughs> I think we missed that. Up. Video on demand, or as they say in the trade, VOD. VOD. Uh, Tango, Tango Shalom, Shalom is now, is now available, available on all, all VOD platforms. platforms, which means video on demand. Look how you know. You must be a high school graduate. I'm a college graduate. Really? Yes. I got an honorary degree from Hofstra. My, did you get an honorary degree? No, I got a degree. <laughs> oh, well, I got honorary. You know, I'm in the Jewish Museum. What for? What do you mean? As a famous Jew in you the are? Bronx. I'm in the famous... I have a, I'm in the Prospect Park in the, in the stones. How big is the stone? <laughs> Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, yada, yada, yada. I actually forgot. I forgot to make the opening graphic for today's show, so here we are. Here we are. Uh, your evangelist of the imagination, of course, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett, and despite that, I'm still here robcasting at you, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. This is Tuesday, November 16th, and this is Rob's Observations, episode number 762. By the way, I want to give a shout out yesterday, big shout out to RuPaul. RuPaul shouted out Tango Shalom, well, on Twitter to his millions and uh, followers. I want to thank you for that, and also to Fran Drescher, who shouted out on Instagram about Tango Shalom and being on VOD. Gosh, it's almost as if that was a coordinated effort. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway, thanks to the two of them for the support. The film is on VOD, and of course it needs your support. Go to Amazon, rent it. It's only like three ninety nine. dollars Give us a five-star review, even if you didn't think of it was worth five stars. We need it. Help us out. Uh, anyway, big doings today in the in the world of science fiction television. Some of it's streaming. I still call it all television. If it's on TV as opposed to movie theaters, to me it's all it's all television. Whether it's streaming, whether it's on network TV, of course, the full trailer, the Expanse season six drops next week. Not next week. Pardon me. Next month. And for those of you uh, who might not know, The Expanse is based on a nine-volume novel series. And if memory serves, the ninth book has yet to come out. But the end of the sixth book is the end of the first part of the story, and then it's a time jump 30 years into the future. So that is why The Expanse is ending after season six. It doesn't really end on a cliffhanger as much as it finishes out the story of this era of space in the expanse uh, but of course the trailer dropped today the extended trailer and it looks like it is actually skewing pretty close to the plot of the sixth book um the rap weighed in on this ross lincoln in the rap uh weighed in on this this morning unless you're the kind of monster who still hasn't checked out the expanse you're no doubt sad that amazon prime video is ending the series with its upcoming sixth season but probably not as sad as the people of earth and mars because it sure like looks like things have gone from bad to worse since the series of gut punches they endured in season five by the end of season five the free navy the extremist opa faction led by marco Inaros had blown up the Martian Parliament, devastated Earth with cataclysmic asteroid bombardment, and managed to destroy several Earth ships before escaping into one of the thousands of Ringgate worlds. 
Alas, the Free Navy is still at large in Season 6 and continuing to fling asteroids at Earth and Mars, and those attacks have done so much damage that it's proven there's no difference between Earth and the desperate poverty and constant danger of life in the belt. Um, meanwhile, Drummer is still on the lam after betraying the Free Navy, but she's picked up some allies from the Outer Planets Alliance factions who are sick of Inaros' boot on their neck. Luckily, UN Secretary General Christian Avicerella has a plan to save everyone that will probably make fans of the Expanse pass out from pure joy. Send ex-Martian Marine Bobby Draper to team up with the crew of the Rocinante, James Holden, Naomi Nagata, Amos Timothy, and of last season, Clarissa Mao, for a secret mission that might turn things around. Please and thank you. Also, something else might be happening. Alien life somewhere on a world we're pretty sure might be settled by the breakaway faction of Martian fascists. You'll have to wait a wee bit just to find out what all of this means. The final seasons of The Expanse premieres on December 10th. Well, one of the things I really love about The Expanse, hence uh, my Rosinante shirt, thank you, Fernando, um, is uh, uh, it's based on a book. So the the storytelling and the character development, now they haven't, it's kind of like, it's an adaptation. So certain characters have left us early, some characters are still here that shouldn't be. Mostly characters have left us early. But uh, when you watch it, especially, it is a slow burn to start. But when you watch it, it becomes very satisfying because the character development and um, everything that's going on is they, they had a plan. Like the Cylons, they had a plan to follow and follow it they have. So you get a fairly satisfying science fiction adventure story, a really interesting look at the Earth. They do representation correctly. There's all different kinds of characters, all different kinds of races, a lot of mixed race heritage people, and they never call attention to it. You know why? Because that's just the future of the Earth. And if you're doing great science fiction, you don't have to like spell it out the way they do on other TV shows. Um, it's a smart show, as opposed to other science fiction shows that are monumentally dumb and insulting of the intelligence of anyone that has a modicum of taste. Maybe that's just me. But anyway, I'm very excited to see The Expanse come back. It's science fiction television done correctly, and uh, it's always welcome when we see it's unfortunate. I mean, this is probably... They, they, they haven't said that they're not going to go back and do... The problem is what happens, so for people that don't know, the way things work in the streaming world, unlike the network world, is on streaming shows, streaming shows that are being paid for by a streaming service, those shows have a certain life before uh, spending more money to make them because everyone gets salary bumps, uh, the writers get more money, the creators get more money, the actors get more money. It's for, for streamers... It doesn't necessarily work. I mean, it's amazing that The Expanse was saved already, that Amazon came and took it over, and we can watch it there. It's amazing it has six seasons, but the problem is, unlike a network show that can run as many seasons as it wants, because each each uh, season is more and more valuable, or or collectively it's more valuable than, than the last, because you're selling it across international markets, you'll be able to sell those things and make money on them, those shows, for a long time. Uh, a streaming service, if they're producing a show, it doesn't necessarily translate to more subscribers if you keep the show going six, seven, eight, nine, ten seasons. There's so many other things on streaming services. People just jump around. They'll watch them, but in terms of why should you spend more money to make them? If you're not getting a return back and streaming services aren't necessarily getting a return by making more episodes, there's no reason to do it. And uh, with network shows, that isn't the case because they can still sell new seasons around the world and make a lot of money doing so. And this is part of what's going on with the IATSE, potential IATSE strike is that the, the economic models of how television was made have been completely disrupted. So um, we're lucky that we have six seasons of The Expanse. On the flip side... Uh, news story broke at noon today, uh, two and a half hours ago. This this was not unexpected, but kind of a head scratcher. Well, not really, but it's kind of a head scratcher on almost the eve of season four of Star Trek Discovery being aired. Star Trek Discovery exits Netflix 
Tonight. That's Netflix around the world. Set for 2022 launch on Paramount Plus and globally. Exclusive Star Trek Discovery is heading home. After four years, over four years after the Sonequa Martin Green led series launched on what was then CBS All Access in North America and Netflix in the rest of the world, Discovery will be leaving the Ted Sarandos co run streamer as of midnight tonight. In a just closed deal between Viacom and Netflix, the Sherry Redstone controlled company has ended the lucrative financial arrangement that launched Discovery back in 2017. In broad strokes, the bargain that then-CBS head honcho Les Moonves made with Netflix saw the latter paying the vast majority of Discovery's hefty budget for the overseas rights. With the top-tier IP fully back in the fold, the plan is for Discovery to take flight on Paramount Plus around the globe starting next year. That would be for Season 5. Discovery Season 4 and Season 5, from what I understand, were both greenlit at the same time. So Season 5 of Discovery is guaranteed. But without Netflix as a partner paying the majority of the costs of the show, that'll be interesting. The likes of the UK, Germany, Ireland, Austria, and Switzerland will be among the first markets to stream Discovery on Paramount Plus of the more than 20 countries the platform is available in outside of North America. Viacom CBS has said as part of an accelerated expansion, they anticipate being in around 45 markets within the next year or so, and of course a high-profile brand like Star Trek will lead that charge. In Canada, Discovery will stay on Bell Media's CTV sci-fi channel and streams on Crave under the long-standing deal with the Northern Broadcaster. No deals were given, uh, no details were given of the deal that CBS, Viacom, and Netflix struck for the first three seasons of Discovery, but we hear it was in the healthy six figures. The arrangement removes any stake that Netflix had in the series. There is a timely quality to the new deal as season four of Star Trek Discovery <clears throat> is set to kick on Paramount plus stateside on November 18th. That's in two days. As we rapidly expand our global streaming footprint, we are bringing more of our top titles home to Viacom CBS for Paramount Plus markets around the world. Viacom CBS Network's international streaming boss Kelly Day told Deadline, we have a strong global and local content pipeline that positions us for success across our regions and repatriating beloved series like Star Trek Discovery for Paramount Plus is another step forward as we bring fans more must-watch series worldwide. Like a lot of media companies, CBS and Viacom separately and since their reunion in late 2019 have looked for opportunities to reduce costs as they ramp up streaming originals. Star Trek series had output deals with various parties, including Bell in Canada and Amazon and Netflix in much of the world. Last March, though, CBS All Access was rebranded as Paramount Plus and its offerings expanded and went global starting over the summer. Earlier this month, Viacom CBS reported having nearly 47 million streaming subscribers across all of its services. It hasn't yet broken out specific numbers for Paramount+. Plus. In a move seen as the sign of difficulty of expanding streaming across the entire world, Viacom CBS formed a joint venture with Comcast for the Sky Showtime platform, which is set to launch in Europe. While Star Trek Picard will still be on Amazon outside of North America and Star Trek Lower Decks will be on the Jeff Bezos-owned streamer, Outside the U.S., Canada, and Latin America, the Starfleet shift off Netflix was hinted at earlier in the year. Back in the end of September, Star Trek, the original series, Star Trek Voyager, and Star Trek Enterprise all left the streamer. Although I think they're still on the streamer in Europe. Now we know where the true final frontier is. What do I think of this? Well, obviously, the f future is for... You're, you're going to see the divisions uh, eventually of all of this IP based on who owns them. Everything is coming home. You've got Disney. Disney Plus will be the place where all Disney things eventually live. HBO Max, if they rebrand it to Warner Discovery, Warner Universe, Warner whatever, that's where all Warner Brothers and associated titles will wind up. Peacock is where everything Universal will wind up. And of course, Paramount Plus is where everything Paramount or CBS will wind up. The real question is, how successful are these people going to be? You know, I, I would have thought that they would have waited to make this move until Star Trek Discovery Season 4 airs. It's very telling that they're making this move now, hoping they're going to create a an appetite in Europe for this show to show up later in 2022. The problem is, their fan base in Europe the people that might still enjoy Star Trek Discovery such as it is, those people, all of your fan base have now been alienated and they're going to either turn to 
illicit means to get the show. Who's who's going to you know read spoilers and recaps when they can't see the show? From what I understand, it aired in Europe literally the next day, so and around the world. So I think what Paramount was doing, uh, they cut off their nose to spite their face, and I I I feel that this was really a boneheaded move. Because the very people that you want, Star Trek fans, and you're using Star Trek as a leader into Europe, even though I would say that I would never bet on Star Trek to be a general population thing. It's not a show like Game of Thrones. It's always been a niche thing. And if you're hoping that Star Trek is going to be the uh, front line that leads the way for your streaming service into more subscriptions and more worldwide exposure, I don't know if that's such the best thing in the world to do. Because I know Star Trek is now a generic term, and they're trying to make Star Trek a generic entertainment brand as opposed to being a singular example of great televised science fiction. It doesn't really matter what's being made now, whether it's Lower Decks or Prodigy or Strange New Worlds or Picard or Discovery. They just feel that it's an established brand, so let's make great product and throw it out there. Unfortunately, it's not great product. I don't think it stands head to shoulders with everything else. You know, I was talking to somebody about this earlier. Star Trek Discovery, here's the difference between classic Star Trek. Classic Star Trek was aspirational. We all hoped that one day we might be the kind of humans like Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, or Picard, um, Riker, and and you can't say Data because he's not human. Take your favorite characters, even Worf. You know, Deep Space Nine, you want to be like Cisco. You want to be like, who I don't know, Dr. Bashir. You want to be like Dax, Kira, whomever. They were characters that we aspired to be. Star Trek Discovery is full of characters that we already are. People love Tilly because they see themselves in her. I never saw myself in Captain Kirk. I saw Captain Kirk as somebody I aspired to be. But like everything else in the modern age, we all want to believe that, well, everybody deserves a trophy. Every kid's the same. We all, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't act or we don't operate each according to our gifts, as they said in Star Trek 2. No, Star Trek used to be a show about excellence. It used to be a show about people aspiring to be the best they can be. Star Trek Discovery is not that show. Star Trek Discovery is a show that says, you know what, it doesn't matter. If you're exactly who you are right now, you can be on a starship because it really doesn't matter. That's what I find insidious, and I think the messaging in Star Trek Discovery and modern Star Trek sucks, because it's no longer about that. It's all about feelings, and everybody everybody gets a trophy. If you want something, you can have it, and if you feel emotional and you feel sad because you're in the final frontier and you've got a thousand years into the future, that's okay. Give me a hug. Let's have a good cry about it. That's pretty much what America has become. You know, let's not step up. Let's not aspire to be great. Let's just accept ourselves the way we are. Because the way we are is just fine. It's not. And that's not what Star Trek is about. But this Star Trek is. But here's one of the things that I'm not going to give you a rant. I won't go on a rant. I'm saving that for Friday. Um, Because, you know, what is that anomaly? We don't know. It's That's why it's an anomaly. But what is it? I don't know. Well, how come you don't know? Because it's an anomaly. Anyway, uh, so um, modern Star Trek, yes. More, more, oh, I see myself in these characters, so I'll watch the show. That's, I mean, really, if you think about it, while the rest of the world moves on and aspires to things, (laughs) we get to be ordinary. (laughs) All of that. But... So anyway, here's what I think is, is, is odd. See, there is a thinking that Star Trek is a brand, that Star Trek can be branded. You can slap a Star Trek brand on anything and it will just work. I think they don't understand that they're diluting that brand because Star Trek, even if it wasn't, even if the stories weren't the best and you got episodes like the Voyagers episode 30, the uh, Voyager episode, the 37s, even if you got bad Star Trek at its core, it was still about humanity aspiring to be better, not humanity learning to come to terms with how we are. Um, you know, that way lies death. That is stagnation. 
And I think one of the things that really is problematic, especially in this country, is we've forgotten about that. We don't want to aspire anymore because aspiring is hard. You know, we want everybody to accept us the way we are and uh, we want what we want. And if my feelings are this is if this is the way I feel, then it's okay. Well, that's not how it works. But anyway, um, but what I find really interesting about this is that CBS is basically sacrificing their fourth season of Discovery around the world because people are going to watch it anyway. They're going to watch it anyway. They're going to find life will find a way. And, you know, if you are a Star Trek fan, you're at the forefront of technology for the most part. And if you want to watch your favorite Star Trek show, hey, you'll do that. Um, I hope that Discovery isn't your favorite Star Trek show, but it might be. And uh, more power to you. I'm glad you like things. It's good to like things. Don't let anyone tell you, especially me, don't let anyone tell you you shouldn't like what you like. So, anyway. Now, this spoke to something. I read an article the other day, and I was thinking about all of this corporate, the mergers, the changes, and I read this great article. Uh, it harked back. It made me, it reminded me of William Goldman's book. I've talked about it before. He, I believe it came out in the 80s called Adventures in the Screen Trade. And William Goldman wrote the novel and wrote the screenplay for, like, The Princess Bride. He wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He's one of the, one of the great screenwriters of the 70s and, and 80s in Hollywood. But he wrote a great book called Adventures in the Screen Trade, which everybody should read if you're at all interested in the entertainment business. All the references are a little dated now. You'd have to know your 70s and 80s movies, but still worth reading. But he famously coined the phrase, in Hollywood, no one knows anything. And that is still the case. And I think more so than ever, we're watching various mergers happen, various companies are buying other companies. There's a great article that I think really speaks to not just the entertainment business, but sort of our big corporate mergers, our corporate culture. And I wanted to share, it's a little long, but I think it speaks to a lot of what's going on in Hollywood. I'm going to read a little bit of it uh, and it's really interesting. This is on Ars Technica, and uh, John Brodkin wrote this. It was published yesterday at 9.30, 9.43 in the morning. Former Time Warner CEO Jeff Bukes says that he and other board members were surprised that AT&T mismanaged the media company after buying it in 2018. Why would they be surprised? Bukes is quoted about the aftermath of the $108 billion merger in a James Andrew Miller book called Tinderbox, HBO's Ruthless Pursuit of New Frontiers, which will be released on November 23rd. The Wall Street Journal received an advanced copy of the book and published an article today describing Bukes' comments. While Mr. Bukes doesn't express regret over the decision to sell AT&T, he said he is sell to to, to sell to AT&T, he said he was angry about how his team of top executives and the staff were treated. Among the high-profile departures were HBO's former boss, Richard Pipler. Mr. Pipler left after clashes over strategy with John Stanky, who was tapped to run the entity, rebranded as Warner Media, and is now chief executive of AT&T. Quote, the most disappointing thing to me about the AT&T merger, Mr. Bukes is quoted in the book as saying, is that he and the board thought AT&T would basically leave our people alone. That didn't happen, he said. We didn't think they would go to such a level of malpractice as to not to listen to anybody, even though they themselves had no experience in those areas. Bukes suggested merger with AT&T. Bukes was Time Warner CEO from 2008 to 2018 and was previously the CEO of HBO. He apparently proposed the sale to AT&T several years before it happened. Mr. Bukes first planted the seed of a sale of Time Warner to AT&T in 2014 as he was looking to fend off Rupert Murdoch's 21st Century Fox takeover attempt. The Wall Street Journal article said, At the time, Mr. Bukes bumped into Randall Stevenson, AT&T's then chief executive, at the Allen & Company conference in Sun Valley, Idaho, and told him, Our conversation ought to be with you instead of Rupert Murdoch, Fox's then chief. Mr. Stevenson replied, Hold that thought, and maybe one day we'll talk. The journal article said that Bukes confirmed the accuracy of his quotes in the book and that AT&T representatives confirmed the accuracy of quotes attributed to Stanky and Stevenson. Stanky took over as AT&T's CEO when Stevenson retired in mid-2020. AT&T completed its acquisition of Time Warner in June of 2018 after defeating a Department of Justice lawsuit that tried to block the deal. 
Bukes left the top post at the same time, collecting an exit package reportedly worth nearly $98 million. Bukes agreed to remain with the company as a senior advisor during a transition period, an AT&T press release at the time noted. His quotes about AT&T's mismanagement of Time Warner seemed to refer to that transition period. Shortly after AT&T assumed ownership of Time Warner, Stanky told HBO employees at a town hall-style meeting that the network wasn't making enough money and needed to produce more shows. Plepler resigned in February 2019 amid reports that he was frustrated about having less autonomy to run HBO under AT&T's ownership. You should all know that this gentleman was one of the great executives at HBO responsible for much of their incredible programming. AT&T spinning off Time Warner division in 2022. AT&T in May of 2021 announced a plan to spin off Warner Media in a new company only three years after buying Time Warner. AT&T struck a deal with Discovery Incorporated to combine Warner Media and Discovery's assets into a standalone global entertainment company and said the transition would close in mid-2022. With AT&T having also spun off DirecTV into a subsidiary, the telecom company will focus on what it probably should have prioritized all along, broadband. AT&T eliminated tens of thousands of jobs across its media and telecom divisions after the Time Warner merger. AT&T had 273,210 employees immediately after buying Time Warner in mid-2018 and 22, uh, 226,840 as of June 2021. They lost 50,000 people. The AT&T employee count dropped to 214,840 after the DirecTV spinoff was completed in August. Despite giving up on Time Warner, Stanky defended AT&T's stewardship of the company. If you are in an acquisition and somebody pays a premium for your stock, by definition it means something is to change, Stanky is quoted as saying in Miller's book, according to the Wall Street Journal. If you paid a premium for an operation and you continue to operate it exactly the same way, you never pay back the premium. Stanky also says that he still believes in the vision behind AT&T's purchase, but that he made the spinoff deal with Discovery in part because investors refused to give us credit for the progress made with Time Warner. One of the jobs I need to do in carrying AT&T forward is ensuring we come up with a strategy that the investor base will tolerate and work through and give us the right credit for, Stanky said. There you go. Now, why did I read this article to you? Why do I think this is important? Here's what's interesting. AT&T, like this article just pointed out, is a telecom company. They acquired entertainment companies like Warner Brothers that has subsidiaries like HBO. And what the fuck do people that work for a telecom company know about making television? Nothing. They don't know. It's the same way. It's the same reason that Bob Chapek has been having some difficulties at Disney. Even though he was a Disney employee, they promote him into an area which he is not familiar with, specifically creative talent relations. Now, I have to say, when I was working for Disney in the early aughts and working on projects uh, for other people, such as Tron, such as Snow White, the, the home video releases, and then I was hired to do my own company work directly with Disney, Ludovico Technique worked directly for Disney on Chronicles of Narnia. Um, he was a very well thought, a thought of uh, executive. The problem is, not everybody can do every job. And and in Hollywood, everybody thinks, I'll tell you something. One thing I've learned in my, in my years working in this industry is that everyone, everyone thinks they know how to make movies. It seems weird, but everybody will give you advice. You know, you show somebody a movie, they're all very quick to tell you what's wrong with it. And in a way, a lot of people aren't wrong. The reason I like to screen movies to people in general is to find out how it hits them. Because they don't have to know about making movies. They just have to know how did this movie work for them or not work for them. So when you show people movies cold, you can get invaluable information about how your movie works or doesn't work. Especially if you're making, say, oh, I don't know, low-budget comedy. You show a movie to somebody, if they laugh, they laugh. If they don't, the movie is just... It, if you've made a movie that's supposed to be a comedy and no one laughs in a movie theater, there is nothing more... Um, well, demonstrative of whether or not that movie works. Trust me, I know. And so what I find interesting is that AT&T executives, everybody moves over and they're all excited. Ooh, we've been given keys to the kingdom. We get to go into the candy store. We get, we get the other kids train sets. So now we can play with them. But if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't understand the business intrinsically and how it all works, you can't feel that just because you work for a telecom company like AT&T, you're going to know how to 
say, get a TV show of HBO caliber off the ground. You don't have the institutional knowledge, and you're never going to have the institutional knowledge because that's something that, while you can read it in books, a lot of it's instinctive. And that was one of the problems when AT&T came over. They made a mess of their idea, and it was a sound idea. The idea is, oh, we're going to control... We're going to control the, the production of the material that we're going to be shoving through our broadband. So that's a great thing. Soup to nuts. But the problem is not everyone can create great television or movies. Uh, even people that are working in the industry don't know how to do that 100% of the time. And now the problem is the corporations are controlling everything. And when people that are put in control know less and less about how the sausage is made, and yet their jobs are contingent on the fact that they get good sausage, sausage made, they're put in a position that ultimately will be untenable, at least the way I've seen it. Let me tell you, I've been working on movies. I worked on my first film in 1989. And while I haven't risen to the highest levels of Hollywood or making a lot of money, I will tell you this. For the 32 years I've worked in the entertainment business, I've seen the same thing happen over and over and over and over again. And that is people that are unqualified to make the kind of decisions they need to make end up getting into positions where they get to make those decisions. And the first thing they do is they resent the people or they don't allow the people who actually know what they're doing to do it because they have to flex. They have to show <coughs> that they're worthy of the positions that they're in. And I get that. I understand that. That's that's life. But the problem is, if you don't know what you're doing, you will fail. And I can't tell you. I mean, even recently in my own life, I was working on a professional deal that I thought was going to happen. And kind of at the last minute, someone called up and said, nope, nope. And not only that, they wanted to take our project away from us and make it themselves. And I was just like, what? But that's to deal with. I've been dealing with it for 30 years. I'll be dealing with it till I'm probably the day I'm di- I, the day I die, and it's monumentally frustrating. And you wonder, like I actually, there was somebody's forwarded me an, uh, an email link to an executive job, and they said, Rob, you should apply for this executive job. It's it's at a big company, and I'm like, Tch. they would laugh if they looked at my resume. I'd put all the stuff I've done down, and they're like, wait, what? <laughs> it wouldn't compute. <laughs> you know, and the fact that all the stuff I've said, hey, you can go watch a movie I produced on VOD or, oh, you can see an animated series I'm working on on Netflix. But, oh, I've also worked in these other executive positions and done this, that, or the other thing. I don't think that my resume, my resume would be all over the place. I mean, it might be nice to work as an executive in a company where I oversaw, say, a significant part of production because I could do it because <laughs> I've done it. But do I want to work in that environment? When everybody is like too worried about, you cannot worry about corporate interests when you're making entertainment. You have to make the entertainment great and allow the corporate interests to take the great entertainment you've made and do something with it. Corporate interests getting involved in the making of entertainment does not work because corporate interests are diametrically opposed to great storytelling. Corporations want to quantify great storytelling. They want to know what that is. We need to put that on a spreadsheet. What do we need to put down here? What do we need to get? How can I explain this to the shareholders? If we do this, we'll make better entertainment. It doesn't work that way. It's never worked that way. It never will. I suppose, you know, the old adage, uh, you know, we'll get rid of these writers and directors and then we'll have something, right? Well, when our, our AI overlords start writing all of our scripts for us, then maybe... They'll, then maybe they'll finally be able to, even though I don't think that's going to work either. But anyway, the decision to take Star Trek Discovery off Netflix and not let it play, I mean, maybe they didn't, maybe they didn't pay for the fourth season, so it's academic. But I don't quite understand that. But that thinking is all about, well, we're thinking down the road. Our Star Trek brand will eat this one. We'll let Star Trek Discovery Season 4 get pirated because somebody will get it later. I think... I think you're underestimating Star Trek or overestimating Star Trek as a brand. Star Trek has to be great. It has to be great to work, and it's always been niche. It'll always be niche. And they're making it even more. I mean, what's really interesting is 
to me, Prodigy and Lower Decks, uh, for what they are, are diluting the brand. They're doing things that they're they're taking away the core brand of what Star Trek is. Sure, you can say that there's some things about Lower Decks I do find redeeming, but you're diluting your core brand. And you know, Prodigy is another step away from the core brand. Whether Prodigy is good or not, it could be a great action adventure science fiction show designed for younger audiences. The real question is, what is Star Trek Prodigy doing to the Star Trek brand in the eyes of people? Like, what do they think of Star Trek? What's Star Trek going to be like in 5 or 10 or 20 years? That's the real question. And the answer is, I don't know. But I don't think it's going to be the Star Trek that we recognize now or that we have been recognizing. It's going to be interesting to see where it all goes. Uh, I'm fascinated because I no longer I no longer have a vested interest in Star Trek, as I've told you when the when the Coda book comes out at the end of the month, Star Trek Coda, it's almost like it's shutting the door on my my Star Trek fandom. I'll still watch Star Trek, uh, but it has nothing to say to me. It's of no value to me anymore, and it's not any value to me because Star Trek the universe existed in my mind, but they've shattered that universe. It's all gone. So Star Trek to me has literally ended. I never thought that would be the case, but it's ended. The Star Trek that I know and love will be over at the end of this month with that Star Trek Coda book three novel. Star Trek that I've known. I mean, I'll still, do you think I don't want to get that 4K director's edition of Star Trek, the motion picture? Of course I do. The Star Trek that I love, I'll still be interested in getting it, but that's gone. It's gone. It literally is over. And I think what's really interesting is I don't think they understand yet from a corporate standpoint what that's doing to Star Trek as a brand. But, hey, I could be wrong. We'll find out, won't we? Um, And yes, we will. Which, what are you going to do? Um... Let's see what we've got. We've got some. Uh, we got some uh, letters. Um, this is interesting from Al. This is from Squid Game. He says regarding player sixty-seven, the Korean defector. An FYI for those who don't know Korean. When she talks to her younger brother and offers him ice cream, she speaks the first sentence with a South Korean accent. Then. When she asks what happened to his face, she switches to a North Korean accent. The conversations between the siblings is the only time North Korean accents are heard in the series. One could interpret this as a sister trying to remind her brother that he still has family even though he's in an orphanage. Also, North Korean defectors face a lot of discrimination in South Korea, so they usually hide who they really are. That comes from Al. Um, so that is, that's interesting. Uh, this one comes from our old friend, Victoria Rosario from in Puerto Rico. Dear captain of the USS Imagination, Dune and the Eternals. I don't remember the last time we had two great science fiction films released back to back. Claudia and I followed your advice and we saw Dune at the biggest and best theater at hand. The IMAX screen, and uh, let me see if I get this, at Mont Montehedra, was still occupied by Bond on Halloween, so we went to the one at Plaza, Carolina. By the way, I'm reading the novel for the first time, but at the moment we saw the movie, I'd only read about 60 pages. Here are my impressions. I'm not a big VFX guy. To me, story and characters are king and queen, therefore I'm almost never dazzled by eye candy. Having said that, I should point out that I have seen David Lynch's Dune several times over the years. And maybe that's why the miracle of Denis Villeneuve's ornithopters took me by surprise and hit me so hard. I loved how director Villeneuve constantly juxtaposed the gray, rain-swept Caladan with the golden, sun-drenched Arrakis during the first half of the film. The contrast felt somewhat violent. Maybe a subtle harbinger of things to come? (laughs) Maybe. Rebecca Ferguson's Jessica is the beating heart of this movie. I'd been impressed with her performance as Rose the Hat in Doctor Sleep, but now I'm a fan. I was aware of Timothy Chalamet for two reasons. 
Gio Campia periodically rants and raves about him, and he was on the short list to play Spider-Man before Tom Holland won the role. The kid is impressive. Most impressive. The Atreides House Massacre felt almost as tragic as the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones because we spent some time with likable characters like Brolin's Gurney Halleck, McKinley's Thufer Howitt, and Momoa's Duncan Idaho. The poisonous last exhalation of the Duke was a money shot, but I was disappointed to see so little of David Dasmaltian as Piter, and I wonder if Fade Rautha will even show up in the sequel. The Gom Jabbar scene was gold. Dune is the best cinematic experience of the year. And then we were dazzled by the Eternals. I've said before that I'm a lifelong Jack Kirby fan, that I met him once in 1985, and that the most heartfelt and powerful mainstream media homage this largely unsung genius has received was at the end of the Apocalypse Now Part 2 episode of Superman the Animated Series. After a character that looked a lot like Jack is murdered by a retreating dark side, Superman and the world mourns. The screen goes black and a legend in white letters reads, This episode is dedicated to the memory of Jack Kirby. Long live the king. Dude, nothing can beat that. But right now, Eternals is worthy of second place despite the liberties taken with the source material. Most of the changes work. A handful, not so much. In a way, Eternals is also a nod to DC Comics. Icarus, Athena, and Makari are deconstructed archetypes of Superman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash, respectively, but they're all clearly different people and marvelously imperfect. I'd forgotten how much I enjoyed disagreeing with entitled and biased film critics. Several had dared call the MCU cookie-cutter films before, and now that director Chloe Zhao delivered an offbeat, more intimate, and thought-provoking type of film, they still bitched and moaned. She swung for the fences and, in my estimation, hit a grand slam. Great cast, solid story, characters that were more mythological and complex than clear-cut superheroes, and so well-defined and human that when they took the unexpected turns, it never felt forced. I was crushed when several of them did not make it. I was also in awe of the Celestials, their scale, imperiousness, and their life cycle. By the way, that you-know-nothing Jon Snow moment followed by a cool vocal cameo was a beauty. The knight has been chronically misused in the comics. Hopefully the MCU will show a new way. Despite the divisive nature of the film, I wonder what percentage of the world has fallen in love with Gemma Chan by now. Oh, I certainly have. I haven't been this mesmerized by an actress's beauty since Catherine Zeta-Jones. Gemma did a fine job as Earth-loving Cersei. Oh, and thank you, Rob, for reading my letters. And stay punk. Long live the clash. Victoria Rosario from Aint in Bayamon, Puerto Rico, USA. Well, always good to hear from you, Victor. I'm glad you had a good experience at the movies. I, too, felt the same way that you did. Uh, I thought that was great. And um, I, I can't... Um, I can't complain, right? Uh, good, good stuff. Uh, here's one from Omar94. Since the pandemic, we've not had a billion-dollar movie. So with that, it looks like we will have to wait maybe a year at the least or longer at the most to see a return of a billion-dollar movie. I know there's always hope for fans for an MCU movie to reach that mark, but I don't know if any will reach that milestone yet. Well, well, Omar, the, I think in what? Uh, it's 3.13 right now. The Spider-Man No Way Home trailer premieres at the Regal Cinema at the Sherman Oaks in less than two hours. And I think an hour after that, it drops on YouTube. So in just a little shy of three hours, we'll know how excited people are going to be for Spider-Man No Way Home. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be good. You know, I've heard that it's so funny. Everybody just assumes that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are in the movie like it's the worst kept secret in Hollywood. Maybe it is. I don't know. But I've heard that if even if they're in the movie, they're not in the trailer. Who knows? Um, I would think that this trailer would pull out all the stops since the movie opens in a month. And if they get us all in a lather by showing us amazing stuff, I don't know if the villains, we already know the villains are all going to be there. So seeing more of the villains, as has been reported today by people, because the rumors say, what rumors? Who the fuck are you talking to? I don't know. But we'll see. Anyway. Uh, Spider-Man No Way Home could make a billion dollars. If I were to take a wild guess, I would hope Avatar 2, 
would be the movie to be the first billion dollar movie since 2019. Now, granted, there's still over a whole year left, but I don't know what else will reach it. Spider-Man No Way Home does have potential, I just don't know. Also, I'm a little biased on wanting Avatar to be the movie, since I really like the first film. Me too. I am an Avatar fan, big time. Um, it's so weird to me that people are, well, Rob, it's just Fern Gully. Really? <laughs> no one's ever been able to do anything like that before or since. It's still the best 3D that's ever been given to us in a movie. And while it did have a classical story, I mean, come on. Even my mom was blown away by Avatar. Um, and I love Titanic, too. However, only time will tell to see what movie will be the first billion-dollar movie since 2019. Thanks, and live long and prosper. Well, there you go. Um, thanks for that. I appreciate that, uh, Omar. Um, most excellent. Let's see. Uh, let's see what people are saying here. Ethan Holgate sends in a uh, sends in a tip. This was actually from yesterday. Uh, but I didn't see it till it went off the air. Uh, hi, Rob. I bought a few copies of Free Enterprise. A few. It's available on DVD in the UK. I wonder which version you got. Watch it for the first time. Absolutely loved it, man. Not only a great movie for sci-fi fans, but a movie that has so much of your personality in it. Also love the opening scene. Well, thank you. I hope you got the extended version. Uh, I don't know if that was ever released in the UK. My The, the five-year mission extended edition of... It's a two-disc set is my definitive version of the movie so far. I still want to fix it, but that's the version I prefer of the film. Anchor Bay put that out, and um, it's a two-disc set. It has a shiny cover on it, if you find the one with the O-ring. But I appreciate it. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the kind words. Sends in a tip. Thank you. And um, most excellent. I think that was probably a diamond you gave me. Willow, Willow Yang. Willow, Willow. Willow Yang says, I've recently started, I've recently restarted watching The Sopranos after making it only to the third season several years ago, and now I'm hooked. Uh, well, I can't wait to hear what you think of the last episode. Um, I still prefer Breaking Bad, but I get Sopranos paved the way. What do you consider to be some top shows that are not Star Trek? Well, I think Breaking Bad's one of the finest TV shows ever made. If you're talking about modern programming, The Sopranos is terrific. Uh, you know, I've been re-watching The Wire. The Wire is one of the greatest TV shows ever. It really is. I mean, I, I really... It gets a little wacky in the fifth season, but I I love The Wire. I think The Wire's outstanding. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of, of really good television i really like the deuce you'd like that there's a lot of sex in that it's about the 70s porn industry uh, i thought that was really good um but you know there's a lot there's a lot of shows that uh i'm enjoying um i <laughs> i've been watching the great british baking show and that show is pretty good too uh, i'm really enjoying it we just started i guess what would be the ninth season the pandemic season which i have yet to see so hmm but there's, you know, there's, there's just so many great shows. It really, I would, I would ask you, what are you interested in? You know, if you're interested in, in, I mean, The Crown, that's a great show. The Crown's a great show. Uh, if you're interested in history, you're interested in mystery. The Chestnut Man, the Danish series, The Chestnut Man, the German series, Dark. You Willow would love Dark. Uh, an incredible time travel show. Uh, it really is Midnight Mass was pretty good. I mean, there's so many good shows out there. It really depends what genre you're interested in. Um, Isaiah Ruiz is here and says, Rob, are you ready for the Spider-Man trailer? I was wondering what you want to see out of the second trailer. Well, uh, for me, I, there's nothing I ever want to see out of a trailer other than the fact that I hope the movie looks good. That's, the, you know, I don't, I, I, I absolutely would prefer to just have somebody show me a picture of the logo and say this movie's coming i kind of hate i mean i've loved trailers my whole life i used to make videotapes of trailers before youtube existed back in the day i love trailers but i just wish i wish i didn't know anything about movies anymore you know i i how, how cool would it have been to go into spider-man no way home and not know anything about it at all and have these villains pop up i mean we already know um willem defoe's green goblin and and dr octopus uh, Alfred Molina has come back and Jamie Foxx is playing Electro. We know that's happening for sure. 
we know Doctor Strange is in the movie. I mean, that's already too much to me. And, I, you know, I don't know who else is in the film. I'm sure there's a lot of surprises, things that we don't even know. Um, I know things that I don't know if they're necessarily true or not. Maybe we'll find out in the trailer tonight. Other characters that no one's even mentioned, I've heard are in this movie. And I won't say who they are. But you won't see them coming unless they show up in the trailer. Um, actually, some people will see them coming but there's because there's photographs. Uh, Fat Steven Gall. by the way, Fat Steven Gall, thank you for being a member of the channel, sir. I very much appreciate it. Um, I saw that you came up. You've been a, man, uh, a member for four months. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. By the way, for all of you who are members of the channel, we are doing another Zoom call this weekend. We have Zoom calls with the members, and they last hours. You can ask me anything you want. We just shoot the shit, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, thoughts on Paramount's Halo series? Well, the Halo uh, trailer, the teaser, it's a teaser, dropped... You know, I, I'm always excited and look, I'm going to watch, I haven't watched, I I haven't watched, um, Cowboy Bebop yet, but everything I've read about it is, is monumentally, um, bumming me out. Um, the reviews on AV club and the review I read yesterday, was it on IndieWire or whatever? It was a, it was an incredible review. It was a very insightful review, but man, it was a slam. It just slammed it hard. And I, you know, and somebody pointed out that, look, if Netflix is going to... if The Sandman's my favorite comic book of all time. And and it's funny because now I'm reading, well, it wasn't as good as it was when I, I, when I was younger. Well, I wouldn't expect it to be, but it's still one of my favorite comic book series of all time. It's, I mean, it is my favorite comic series of all time. So um, I can't wait to see it. But when, you know, when, when these things are translated into other mediums, it's hard. You want You want everything to be fantastic and it's tough um are you supposed to be slavishly devoted to the anime or not that's a tough one but with halo look they can go in uh, all kinds of directions i mean i'm always suspect of video game adaptations i mean the witcher's pretty good but they've, they've got a book component i mean halo was derived from a video game you know master chief hey i hope it's cool the problem is the whole concept is designed around the idea of playing it. And I know there's spin-off novels and the universe is really interesting. But, you know, it, it, the the problem with a game uh, a, a series like Halo unless it's really good like look, I've not seen Arcane yet, the League of Legends animation that's on Netflix. Everyone said to me it's amazing. And I can't wait to watch it. I'm like is it better than Dota and people are like, "Well, it is." I'm like, "Well, fuck you." But no, I understand. I mean, we 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 Look, I'd love the Halo series to be great because I think the world building is really cool. But unless it's really, really, really good, people are like, I'm going to go fucking play my games because if they're not as fun as the game, it, it, that's the problem. If you take a, a video game that everyone loves and you translate it into another medium, you have to make the movie or whatever at least as entertaining as the game itself, if not more so. And I don't know if that's possible. Like when you get to control Nathan Drake's destiny, is watching a movie with a young Nathan Drake going to be something that really holds your attention the way playing the game does? Don't know. But uh, I think that's what video game adaptations are fighting. They're always fighting that. Uh, Todd Michael Januszewski. I know I'm not saying that right, but I know, you, I know you, you've corrected me. But uh, Todd Michael says, regarding Star Trek, I'm in the same boat as you. My world of Star Trek, my universe of Star Trek has now passed. And you know what? I'm good with that, I think. Todd Michael, you and me both. Um, my love of Star Trek informed the first half of my life. And that is, it is now over. And it's it's now over. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what told me. Uh, Una McCormick's, I was reading her autobiography of Spock. And it was delayed a long time. And they have shoehorned all of this discovery material in it. And it doesn't compute. See, if if the if the people that had if they'd taken over Star Trek Discovery and made their own show, I would have been fine with it. But what they have done is they've gone back and they've retconned classic Star Trek. That is something the older shows I mean, Next Generation would retcon certain things like the post-atomic horror of World War III 
Now, that wasn't something they dealt with. We knew there was the eugenics wars in the original series, but you could be like, okay, we hadn't heard about that. You can add to something, but you don't go back and fundamentally change characters. Now we've got these shows, Picard, Discovery, and now Strange New Worlds, that are fundamentally changing everything that came before. And I think that's a horrible strategy. I think that was a horrible thing to do because the the writers are taking it upon themselves to impose their modern version of what a character should be. Like, let's give, again, let's give Spock a learning difficulty or deficiency so more audience members today can relate to the character of Spock. It's like, fuck off. Fuck you. Who the fuck are you lazy, candy-ass fuckers? I mean, give me a fucking break. Sorry, is that too many fucks? It really bothers me when writers go back and they think that, oh, let's go back and change the characters. Doctor Who, you know, the sacred forgotten child no one's ever heard of until now, bullshit. You know, if you're going to take over a franchise, move forward. Take the franchise forward. Go do something you haven't done before. Don't give me Paul Guilfoyle as the walking, talking guardian of forever. Don't fucking do that. Otherwise, you know what I'm thinking? Fuck you. Because that's lazy. Just because you're clever. Like, hey, we're going to go back to Harlan Ellison's original incarnation of the script. No, you shouldn't. You know why? Because his his script was rejected and rewritten. I get it. You're trying to be cheeky and clever. That's all anybody... You'd rather be cheeky and clever so people can look at you and go, oh, that was a really good idea. No, one, it wasn't. It wasn't a good idea. And two, it wasn't cheeky or clever. It was easy. It was something that you did that said, look at me. Look at me. I want to be cool. So I'm going to go adapt Harlan Ellison's original script and steal that idea for the Guardian of Forever. Fucking dumb. And this is not, this is the problem that I have with with a lot of these. And it's not because of I don't mind representation. You want to say a representation is done correctly? Fuck, watch the Great British Bake Off. There's more representation in that show correctly done than there is in an entire season of Star Trek Discovery. Because oh wait a minute, in the 32nd century, hang on, let me tell you my pronouns. Come on, I mean, give me a break. Uh, do you think? that human beings in the 32nd century with all the medical technology that's available, all the different interspecies relationships, do you think anyone's going to care? No. And when you pander, when you try and, well, let's just pander to today, your writing is shitty. Go home. Don't write anymore. But, hey, I'll be tuning in to watch your fourth season. Um, Anyway, so Todd Michael, I am done. I am done with Star Trek. Unless, you know, I'll go see a movie if it comes out. But my God, uh, Star Trek is is adrift in a sea of creators that don't know what the fuck they are doing with the series. Hey, anyone, if you're listening, let let Nicholas Meyer make his three night con miniseries, please. The scripts are great. Let him go do that. Other than the just ridiculous garbage you keep churning out in live action, do that. Do that for me, would you? Anyway. Uh, Louis Terrassas says, so proud of you. Uh, Fuck John Campion, Star Trek, Evolve. Now, first of all, Louis, let me explain something to everybody. I love John Campion. By the way, look at his show. Go back and look, look, look at, he's made some changes in his, in his uh, set. The John Campion show, at least on his cameras he has, it looks incredible. He does a terrific job. My only thing about the John Campion show is he wanted to make changes for the show and bring it in to the studio. I always find these things out after the fact. I never get to have a conversation with the changes John wants to make, whether he wants to change the time or anything. He tells me after the fact, so I never really get to weigh in. And, you know, I said I wanted, like, if I could be on the show, I could. The problem is I can't drive two and a half hours to be on a 90-minute show. And over the course of a week, or if I'm on four days a week or two days a week or whatever, it's either half or a full work day I spent commuting. Now, if I was working an eight-hour day and had to make the commute, it'd be okay. But I don't make nearly enough money, and I don't have enough time with all the projects that I'm working on in order to make that drive. And I understand the way how he wants to get that energy back in the studio, but I I mean, I completely respect him. I don't have a problem with John. I think what he does is great. I've learned half of what I know about YouTube from him. You know, he's got a lot to offer. I think he's still doing a great show. And this idea, no beef with John. I have no, no beef with John Campia. Uh, at all. I, I admire him and respect him, and I think he puts on a good show. And this, I mean, he's got the best looking YouTube pundit show. I mean, his set, if you look at the way he's got his set, it looks better than Joe Rogan's. 
I mean, the actual quality of his image, the way he's relit his stage, looks fantastic. So, look, uh, I am evolving. I liked doing John's show. It was fun. You know, it was fun. But now, you know, it's not just the YouTube space. I've got a lot I'm doing. And I just, I can't, I don't have time to drive. Like, even if I left right at 1130, I mean, there's, you, there's traffic coming back during the day. It might take me an hour and a half or two hours to get home in traffic, which means half my day is over. And I, I just, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. But I don't, you know, I, I love John. I have the most uh, utmost respect for him. And I, I, I have not a bad word to say about him. John has treated me very, very well. And uh, we've had a, a, a long, um, uh, if he asked me to go back on the show and I could, um, and I could um, be on it remotely, I would. Because uh, that makes sense. But now, like, you know, like even this morning, I, I had another video I was doing for somebody else that I had to deliver. I got up and I did the Hollywood half and half. Then I did work for them all the way up until one o'clock in the afternoon. So I couldn't have done that. So, yeah. But so, Louis, I appreciate the fact that you're a, a longtime member of the Post Geek Singularity. But no, John Campia is worthy of respect. <clears throat> Uh, Matt Lines sends in a super chat and says, what do you think of Foundation? If watching, oh, I am, but I haven't watched all of it. I've watched the first three. Every episode looks great, and I believe there is something there. The problem is that I also find it incredibly dull for long stretches at a time. Well, Matt, I don't disagree with you. I think Foundation is one of the most incredible-looking science fiction TV series ever made. The problem is the very heady subject matter is not exactly uh, scintillating action-adventure fodder. So it's definitely problematic from that perspective. So I, I get where you're coming from. And it is. I mean, it, it is kind of dull. It's, it's a science fiction show that isn't thoughtful enough, and it doesn't have enough action adventure in it. Um, but I do like all the actors. It's really handsomely mounted, and I am enjoying it. I am enjoying it. Um, <clears throat> uh Goku Sambiz, Sambiz, is that how you pronounce that? I like that, Goku Sambiz. Um, I hope Morbius turns out great. I'm looking forward. I, I, I think it looks great. You know, I love the character. I love that they've made the movie. I love that Jared Leto's playing him. I mean, where do you see Jared Leto's transformation in House of Gucci? It's fucking unbelievable. Unbelievable. One of the great, I mean, you don't, you don't see a shred of Jared Leto in his either the, the way the character looks or his performance, it's amazing. Loved it. And I was always worried, is he going to go too far? Is he going to go too far? I didn't think so. I thought that um, I thought that um, that it was good. You know, I enjoyed it. I, I uh, And so Morbius, look at him as a vampire. This shit looks dope. <laughs> I mean, I, I want to watch it. I can't wait. Uh, Jay Bling sends in a tip and says, do you think a San Andreas sequel will happen? Uh, it keeps getting asked about because it was a hit, but it's been a while since it was announced and natural disaster movies don't have a history of getting sequels. Yeah, I don't know. Like, are they going to have another big earthquake? They pretty much destroyed the entire West Coast. So what are you going to do? Um, you know, I think St San Andreas is kind of a standalone movie. It's kind of the way, like, Roland Emmerich's 2013. <laughs> you know, it's, although I got to tell you, I, I, I will not... I mean, for all my talk about Star Trek and Discovery, I will not deny that the idea that there's alien and machines, alien technology inside the moon, fucking bring that shit on. I'm in. Uh, I love it. I can't wait. I, I, I moonfall. Bring it in. Bring it out. I or, uh, bring it on. I will see it. I um, I <laughs> I watched that trailer way too many times. That new one. <laughs> Just like the, the Expanse trailer, I watched that too many times. Um, so, Jay Bling, I don't think a San Andreas sequel will happen. Can't think of a funny name, sends in a super chat and says, Currently, all of the percent, all, all of the percent hammered at fine dining restaurant. Wait, currently, all of the percent hammered at fine dining restaurant right now. Oh, not going Patrick Bateman. I just, oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> Uh, you're not going Patrick Bateman. You just wanted to say thanks for your channel. Can't think of a funny thing to say, a funny name. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I'm a whole, I'm a huge, as you know, well, maybe you know, I don't know. I love American Psycho. 
And uh, thanks to Dieter Bastian, I've got that great German big box set that even comes with Patrick Bateman's business card. Although I'd like to have had Paul Allen's business card too. But I appreciate that. Thank you for the support. Can't think of a funny name. I very much appreciate that. Fat Steven Seagal sends in a super chat and says, By the way, Rob, how's my Boba Fett slave one? Is she good? She is sitting right up there. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Fat Steven Seagal is talking about my Code 3 uh, Slave 1. And Code 3 was a company, it still exists, Code 3 is a company that made die-cast Star Wars uh, um, ships. And at first, they were using the model kits, like the X-Wing they did and the Millennium Falcon they did, they were using the model kits as the basis um, of their die-cast models. And they, they were, the X-Wing and the Falcon were not that accurate. However, their die-cast Darth Vader's TIE Fighter, the TIE Advanced, and the Slave 1, the Slave 1, the Slave 1 must weigh 10 pounds. It has to weigh, it's fucking entirely die-cast. It's awesome, and I, I love it. And one day, Fat Steven Seagal, you know what, I'll have to leave in my will that Fat Steven Seagal gets... The slave one. He must possess it. So, it's pretty good. Uh, Goku Sambas. Goku Sambas says, What's your thoughts on Crusade, the branch off of Babylon 5? It's very much like Space Battleship Yamato. Also, have you ever watched Gene Roddenberry's Earth Final Conflict? Yes. Earth Final Conflict was, first of all, it was okay. You know, I didn't dislike it. I didn't like it. I mean, there was a lot of these lower budget genre shows that were being made. Obviously, Final Conflict and uh, Andromeda came out of, and I thought both of them actually had really interesting ideas. I just don't know budgetarily if they had what they needed to be as effective as they could have been. And I thought I thought Earth Final Conflict was also made in Canada, which at the time I think was a bit of a liability. And, and Crusade, you know, I liked Crusade, but again, it was. It just reminded me that I, I really wish J. Michael Straczynski knew that he was going to get a fifth season of Babylon 5 so he could have extended the Shadow War out. And I, I felt as much as I liked... I mean, I love... Seasons 2, 3, and 4 of Babylon 5 are some of the great sci-fi TV of all time. And it's going to be interesting to see if he gets to go back and... I mean, is he rebooting, reinventing? It's going to be really interesting to see what uh, he does. But, you know, I like I like Crusade. I didn't love it, but I liked it. I watched it. I You know, I thought it was worthwhile. Tom Jr. Jackson, we are all goof people, Tom. How did La Brea get a season two? I watched the pilot. Okay, I don't know if you guys have seen La Brea. Longtime viewers of this channel will know that I have a big soft spot for Manifest, the gobbledygook that is Manifest, and I'm so happy it's coming back. <laughs> but La Brea actually has an intriguing premise. <laughs> <laughs> that there's like a doorway. I, again, I only watched the pilot. A doorway to another world around the La Prea Tar Pits. Okay. Um, uh, hey, the same loca the same place where volcano took place. You know, I mean, I'm all, uh, I'm all in. How it got a second season? People are watching it. They, it, they. It's just, again, it's one of these impossible premise shows. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I need to watch. Uh, I watched the pilot. I was like, okay. I just didn't know if I could go down that road again because Debris, I was really kind of enjoying Debris, another one of these impossible premise shows. Gone. But the fact that La Brea uh, is still chugging along, maybe I'll have to give the first season a look. And But it's right up my alley. I just, you know, do I really want to get involved? <laughs> do I want to? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Should I watch it? Uh, Cyber Shaman X or 10 Cyber Shaman X says anxiously awaiting book three of Star Trek Coda. The second book almost had me in tears, excited, but sad. The last gasp of classic Trek is escaping the body of the franchise. Ooh, you and I, you and I, Cyber Shaman X, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. What Cyber Shaman is talking about is of course the three part Star Trek Coda novel series that was written by Dayton Ward, James Swallow, and one of my favorite Star Trek novelists, David Mack, and it is basically their version of Crisis on Infinite Earths, and their mandate was, when they started, the Star Trek novels have had a continuity post-Nemesis, 
post Dominion War, post Nemesis. That's been pretty good. So all the way back to 2002, they've basically almost had 20 years of telling the stories like what happened in the Star Trek universe afterwards. And it's been a very, very tight knit, close continuity uh, f- through dozens of books. And for the most part, it's been really, really good. I've really, really enjoyed it. Well, when Picard came along, it's so far afield and so less good than what these novelists have come up with. And it's really, it's really kind of a shame because I would have gone, if, if look, if I had to do a Star Trek Picard show, I would have just got these novelists, I would have got them in a room, and we would have broken the story of Picard three seasons. What will we do, boys? Or, and, and bring in Una so we got girls too. Boys and girls, what are we going to do? Let's do, let's break this whole thing down. And it would have been infinitely better, infinitely better than the horror that is Star Trek Picard. And coincidentally, David Mack was a consultant on Prodigy. You cannot tell me that no one would have thought about putting a Medusan in a mobile metal suit. That was David Mack all the way. Now, he'll never admit it, but come on. <laughs> a Medusan. Are you kidding me? That there's there's a character from Peter David's book continuity? Come on. Who thought about that? Consultant, co-creator. I know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not. So Coda Book 3 is the end of this continuity. And it really is Crisis on Infinite Earths. It's Crisis on Infinite or Crisis in Infinite Star Trek universes, which I think is really interesting because at the end, whatever is going to happen will make sure that that continuity which is going to be revealed as its own legitimate continuity that if you ask me what happens and no one has, the Davidians are going to collapse that that universe. Our universe that we've been watching as the prime universe or that we've been reading as the prime universe is going to be shown as being an offshoot. And it'll it'll the, the, all the characters will realize that we aren't the prime universe. And it's going to go away. At least that's my... That's how I'm thinking it'll probably end. Who knows? Don't know. Don't know. But anyway, we'll see. And um, uh, uh, I can't wait. And it's the, it's the longest of the three books, which is good because I read each of those books in like two sittings. So Julian Mott says, man, am I going to miss you on the John Campy show? Always, brother. Well, Julian, maybe I can come back. There's no one that says I, I can't, I don't think. Um yeah, I mean, if there's time to do it, I would, I would, I just can't drive, you know. And and what what I find interesting is I understand that John wants to recreate that energy, but if you're going to put people in a room together, let's see them on screen together, you know. Let's let's see people interacting because that's what what's fun. If you're if you're just looking at people that are in studio, I mean, you can see Ray and you can see uh, Kimberly in the same frame. But if you can't see everybody along with John and you're not all interacting, what's the point of doing it all in studio? You know, um, because that's what people want to see. Just a thought. Uh, Terrier, Terrier, all the way from Norway, says, X06 just announced the EMH from Voyager. What do you think about that face sculpt? I mean, you see it's him, but there's just something off, very off. You know, I have to say that the X06, uh, what Terry is talking about is... Um, the X06 is a company that um, has been making. They're the first company. There was QMX that was doing premium, hot toys esque, high end Star Trek figures, but they only did a few, and um, they came out few and far between. And then they lost the license. But a guy who who went over to Q, who worked at QMX to start his own company, X06, and they've so far released two figures, Picard and Data, and they're first rate top of the line all the way i think they have great face sculpts the next figure that they are that that is going to arrive some people are getting it in the next couple weeks is Catherine janeway the tailoring on the outfits is incredible the face sculpts have been good so after janeway the next figure they announced is the emh that's the one that's coming out and then seven of nines coming out after that um interesting that they they did picard and data which makes sense I've heard that they're going to do a Borg Queen, but it's going to be a statue that they weren't able to make a, an actual figure of her, which I find kind of weird. I mean, I don't want a statue. I want a figure of her. And I, I mean, if they make, can make a little figure that can come apart, you can take her out. Can't they make a bigger figure? I don't know. Apparently not. But yes, the EMH is coming out. 
And I think it's going to be, I think they're going to get the head sculpt right. Maybe the prototype wasn't as right as we wanted it to be. I thought it looked pretty good, but there was something off about it. I, I totally agree. Brendan Sheehy, one of my own moderators too. Uh, Brendan Sheehy says, Rob, what do you think of Mel Gibson directing Lethal Weapon? In many ways, he's just the right guy to inherit the franchise, and he is sure to bring it back to the grittier roots of the first and best, best Lethal Weapon. Do you think it's a silly idea? Well, Brendan, you know, I talked about this yesterday. It was announced yesterday. We talked about it on the show. I think, I think that um, uh, Mel Gibson is a first-rate director. I mean, he's an incredible director. He really is. Uh, you know, you look at the films he's made, Hacksaw Ridge, Apocalypto, uh, Braveheart. I mean, he's really a first-rate director. So him doing a Lethal Weapon movie, I love that idea. But, but Danny Glover's 75. And the Lethal Weapon, the, the characters were cops. And you can't tell me that that uh, any police force, I mean, they might they might have to play up the fact that they're in retirement and something happens, but it's such a weird idea that the very idea of Lethal Weapon came about because Mel Gibson's character, uh, uh, Martin Riggs, well, he was, because of his military training, he was declared a lethal weapon. And it's kind of moved away from from that. I mean, if he directs the movie, I bet it'll probably be pretty damn good. Does the world need it? Mm, don't know. Um, but I'm not going to say. I, you know, I wouldn't say no to something like that. I think that um, I think that could be could be cool. You know, I mean, who doesn't who doesn't love it? I mean, I love. But even you know what? Even. Um, um, like Eric Clapton and and what is it? Uh, Michael Kamen and D is it David Sanborn? Uh, and Michael Kamen's no longer with us, and that -do 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 -do, that music thing that they would always play. And you've got other what is it? Um, Mary is it Marianne Trainer? Is that what Ma Mikey Lita was saying to me on Twitter? There's there's characters. There's the the captain. He's long gone. So half the cast is <laughs> the supporting cast is gone. But I think you know, hey. If we're gonna get the Rocky Balboa of the of the Lethal Weapon franchise, eh, I'd watch it. You know, what's not to? I just I just wish that we had new things being created that weren't like, you know, I was saying yesterday we get buddy cop or buddy team up movies like Red Notice, and you look at it and it's all, well, do I have to say it? Well, let me say it. No verisimilitude, and uh, then what do you do? So. Well, what can I say? Well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kind souls, gentle beings, all of you throughout the 28 known galaxies, however you identify, I'm going to bring this, Rob Observations, episode number 762, to a close. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who supports the channel via Super Chats and Tips, very much appreciated. And those who become members, there will be a member uh, call those are always fun they last for hours and i get to see all of you and it's always nice to check in um yeah and if you want to send me a letter you can to the burnetwork.net website if you go in the top right corner there's a place to submit i want to thank my moderating staff darren seeley greg smith justin toner louise x sparrow uh thank you all for being the moderators that you are and making this a nice place to visit but i have to live here and on that note, I will remember and remind you to. I will. I will remember to remind you that every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say to all of you, as I always say, have a better day. <laughs>